Hi there, this is me again, Steve Kaufman, and of course, uh, I'm very happy to have a special guest, Richard Simcott. I don't know if he needs an introduction. Uh, to those of us in the uh, language learning community, he is one of the, uh, the gurus. Uh, he doesn't want to admit how many languages he speaks, but it's got to be many times more than I do, and he speaks them very well. And so he's uh, a very well-known uh, polyglot, and I would like to ask him some questions. Richard, mm -hmm. is that Thank okay? Thank you for having me. Well, I'm very pleased to have you. And uh, what I want to ask is this, basically. Uh, there are polyglots well-known within our community, mm -hmm. uh, and there are many things that we have in common mm -hmm. in terms of our methods and our attitudes, mm -hmm. but there also are differences. Yep. And uh, so I'm a very much input-based kind of learner, uh, and then I get to a point where I want to speak, but I don't go to school. Okay. I have for French and then for Chinese, but all the other languages, no. I understand that you actually enjoy going to language class. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to ask you about your method of learning, which I should say has been very successful, obviously, because you speak a lot of languages very well, and what you think is important and what is the role of the language class. Okay, so yeah, it is interesting that quite a lot of people say that they don't use language classes or they, they find them uh, unhelpful or too slow. I think finding the right language class is really important. Mm -hmm. So I would never say that I do it all the time for every language, of course, right. it's possible. Right. Um, but if there is a language class, I'm a very social animal. Right. I love the interaction with the people, I love the things that I learn from them. That I so it's not a one-on-one -on -one class? No, 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 no. I go to a group if possible. So, for example, when I moved to uh, Skopje, where um, I now live uh -huh. in the Republic of Macedonia, I wanted to learn Turkish because it's one of the main languages that's spoken in the city. And I went to the um, Yunus Emre Institute in mm -hmm. the center of Skopje with a group of people who wanted to learn Turkish mm -hmm. with an, on an intensive course. Right. So that at least I wouldn't feel that I was going very slowly. Mm -hmm. And I actually really enjoyed it because I got insights into, because they were all from local uh, people. Macedonians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was getting input from them, from how they saw the Turkish language affect their own language. They were sharing... And of course you Turkish. speak Macedonian. Yeah, so of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the course was only in Macedonian, well the course was supposed to be just in target language in Turkish. Right. But if there were ever any explanations needed, mm -hmm. they would be given in Macedonian. Right. And that wasn't a problem, so I was sort of doing the sort of outside class, we'd have a chat in Macedonian or in right. Turkish or whatever. Um, but I found that really interesting. And, and how many hours a day or how many times a week? I did 16 hours a week. Uh, oh, that's a lot. Course, yeah, yeah. yeah. And was that the sum total of your effort or did you then go home and do other things? No, I mean, you always use it. So I, right. I, I tend to practice as much as possible. So I'd mm -hmm. find and seek out um, Turkish speakers in town mm -hmm. and practice it with them. And um, I'd listen to bits of things on, on TV, mm -hmm. Turkish uh, news or whatever I could find. Right. And, you know, I believe as well in a lot of input. So right. you need a lot of... Um, Sort of time to sort of exposure to the language. It's right. not just a, a one source. And is your input primarily then audio input because you're talking to people and they're kind of the, the language is coming back at you, or did you also read in Turkish? So in the I mean in the beginning, it, the the reading you can do is limited, of mm -hmm. course. Um, yes. But um, yeah, I do I do different things. So now, for example, with Turkish, I may I may read subtitles. I may have a program on in English, right. or I may have the subtitles in Turkish, mm -hmm. or I may watch something in Turkish and have subtitles in, in Macedonian, or mm -hmm. in, in, in Serbian, or mm -hmm. in another language that I speak mm -hmm. um, well. Right. And, uh, and that way I find that it just sort of keeps things interesting. Mm -hmm. But the classes really were fundamental to bringing me on because I had right. very definite goals. Mm -hmm. I was taken out of my comfort zone, which I think sometimes as a language learner, especially if you're autodidactic, mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can look so m much in on yourself mm -hmm. that you will only learn things that you're really interested in. Right. But when you have a, a conversation with a language partner, mm -hmm. of course, you, you have to, there's a sharing right. that needs to go on. Mm -hmm. They might mention things that you've never heard of mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. things that you're not interested in. Right. So the language class I found, because you had different personalities, right. helped to really bring those things out. Right. Now, uh, of course, you were in... Macedonia, uh, learning Turkish, which is a language that is spoken there. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you're learning a language, or have you been in a situation where you are learning a language where there are no no speakers of the language locally? Uh, there may not even be courses offered locally. Uh, what do you do then? Then normally what I do is get a book. I like course books. I mm -hmm. like to read through and, and get an idea of the language. So mm -hmm. 
in that way, I guess I'm maybe a more typical polyglot because mm -hmm. I think a lot of polyglots do tend to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They'll just get a book and work through it mm -hmm. as though they were in a class. Mm -hmm. But what I will normally do is supplement that with um, a teacher online, say from mm -hmm. italki. Okay. I will find um, a speaker mm -hmm. and I will um, maybe not always use the book exactly as it's prescribed. Mm -hmm. I would read a dialogue mm -hmm. uh, and then I would make that dialogue relevant to my own life. Mm -hmm. So when I was learning Norwegian for a trip mm -hmm. to Norway, mm -hmm. I took the Teach Yourself a Norwegian book, mm -hmm. I read it over the course of about a month, mm -hmm. and then each lesson with my teacher, I'd meet once a week, mm -hmm. and I'd tell her the unit I'd studied to talk about what happened in this the This is story. online, this is I talk. Online, yeah. yeah. Talk about the, the, what happened in the book, mm -hmm. what happened with the, the characters in the book, mm -hmm. and then say, but in my life, this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. So I'd make it relevant to myself. Right, and right, right. then mm. I went to Norway and practiced mm. with people mm -hmm. and chatted away. Oh, yeah. So yeah, it's but it's still there's, a, there's an element of teaching there because you're you're sort of you're making up your own teacher right. environment. Right, you get what right, I mean. right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, and uh, you know I certainly have shared that experience. For example, with Czech, where I studied Czech on my own, but with the goal of going to Prague to mm -hmm. sort of interact with people yeah. and activate it. And also, uh, of course, I use uh, online tutors. Uh, and try to get them to talk about, for example, say lessons that I'm studying, uh, yeah. you know, at Link and whatever. And so it it is similar to that extent. Although I'm I tend I do use Teach Yourself as as a place to get started in the mm -hmm. language. Exactly. Uh, but then I try to get into a, a range of, a, of you know content mm -hmm. uh, you know that I can work with. Um, to what extent do you think the polyglots? How much of their learning methodology is common? And to what extent do they have sort of their own individual approaches? I think many people have very different approaches, uh, but the the one thing that they they really have in common is the sort of dy so I guess motivation. It sounds a bit right, of trite, I guess. But, yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> but, there. Yeah, but it's um, it is important because they have the motivation from a general um, and very concentrated interest. It's very focused interest in, right. in learning it, and they question language. I think mm -hmm. is what they have in common. So, you know, if, if you, if, I guess you maybe do this as well. But if you walk down the street, yes, you've been learning Czech. You walk down the street in Prague, you see a word you don't know. And what do you do? Do you look at it and think about it? No, no. just ignore it. <laughs> ignore it. So even even there, maybe yeah. maybe that it's still different. I don't yeah. know. I, I, let's put it this way: I enjoy the fact that I'm walking down the street and I can read mm -hmm. uh, certain things and. Whatever I can read in Czech, I'm very happy about. If I can't read the word or don't know what it means, I just I just ignore it. In that scenario, like if I'm learning on Link, I'm looking the word up and I'm yeah. saving it and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm out there, even if I'm out with people and they're using words that I don't know, I don't uh, I don't worry about it. No, I guess focusing on sort of a random word maybe right. not, not be the example I'm looking for. It would be something that I know that I'm going to pass every day or mm -hmm. I see. Constantly, yeah. If so, I see it more often, I might worry about it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. for example, in I was I was learning Latvian and I went to Riga, right. and I kept seeing the word Jerba, right. and I was like, "What the hell is this word?" And I, I hadn't learned it in my yeah. in any of the texts I learned. It was actually just clothes. Yeah. But I looked it up on my on my mobile phone, found out the word, and then every day I would go past and right. I would keep seeing it, and it would remind me. Right. You know of the word. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, certainly, but I think in the total number of words that I learn. Mm -hmm. The number of words that sort of stick out like a sore thumb and bother you and what does that mean and stuff, it, they're not that many. If there's 50, no, there's 50. Not. It's not like thousands. No. No. No, I think it, the context of the words is really important, you know, right. how you learn them, where you learn them, yeah. in where, which words go together, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're learning English and you learn the word quench, right. well, there's no point learning the word quench on its own. Quench no. your thirst. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a set phrase almost. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we, we tend to develop sort of the, the habit or the experience of being able to sort of latch onto these, these mm -hmm. phrases. Uh, so to wrap it up then, I think though that uh, the nice thing about this conference is that uh, different people have learned a different number of languages, mm -hmm. uh, speak them. I mean, there are some people here who speak two. Yeah. And, and want to almost apologize for the fact that they only speak yeah, two or three languages they shouldn't and everybody is very supportive and, and uh, respectful of the fact that yeah. people dif people have different approaches but the same goal exactly They're not even the same goal some people want to become totally fluent yeah, some yeah, people yeah. just want to have a, an understanding of the language and that's all fine and so um, 
you know, the next time there's a polyglot gathering near you, and the next one is in Reykjavik, your, yes, your a polyglot conference in Reykjavik. And what are the dates there? It's the end of October, so 27th, 29th of October. Okay, and uh, Richard is also sort of the originator of these polyglot uh, gatherings or conferences, because the first one was in uh, Thessaloniki. Budapest. Oh, Budapest. Budapest was the first one. What year was Which that? Which you kindly supported. Um, yes. That was five years ago now. Five years ago. And then you've had it in Thessaloniki. Yes. And yeah. there's there's another, it's called, called The Gathering, which there's was in gathering. Berlin, and then in Bratislava, yeah. and now we have here. And I, at, at some level, we all hope that, uh, you, you know, what, what I call the polyglot ghetto, which is all the keeners, <laughs> that somehow this will expand into the broader community and encourage yeah. people to learn languages. And I would encourage you to participate in any polyglot conference gathering that may be taking place near you. Yeah, I think it's infectious, you know, the whole yeah. the, the environment is infectious. People uh, are genuinely very open mm -hmm. and whether you're on your first or your 21st language, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Um, you, we all learn from each other, mm -hmm. you know. Yep, absolutely. And we don't judge each other. No. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.